thank you, Catherine, and I'd like to thank CDHF for inviting uh, me and all the other speakers here and for you to hang in there and uh, learn as much as you can from our talks. Um, I have no relevant disclosures to this presentation, and in the next 10 minutes, I'll try to briefly summarize uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, the treatments that are, are we use, and specifically um, how it affects pregnancy, and then considerations of uh, treatments in pregnancy. So the important thing to recognize is that inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, is not the same as irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. That's a common uh, misperception or uh, misuse, I guess, or interchange of those uh, acronyms. However, people who have IBS can have IBD, and people who have IBD can have IBS. The two main types of IBD are ulcerative colitis um, and Crohn's disease. So on the left um, is a diagram, uh, actually from CDHF, <laughs> where they show that ulcerative colitis involves just the large bowel, so the large colon, whereas Crohn's disease can affect anywhere from your gum down to your bum. So that means it can affect um, ulcers, so they can have ulcers in the mouth, they can affect the esophagus, the stomach, small intestine, and the large intestines. And importantly, I've tried to draw um, on the other side of the Crohn's disease, is that Crohn's disease actually can cause deeper ulcers. And that means that it can poke through the lining of the bowel and connect to various other organs. Most commonly, it actually pokes through the, to the skin around the bum. And that's important specifically, and I'll talk later about that, for women um, who are planning pregnancies or who are pregnant because it could affect um, how they deliver their baby. Because as you can imagine, if you have these holes or these connections between your bowel and your bum, um, there are a potential for infection um, and poor wound healing. So very briefly, um, even if you do not have IBD yourself, you probably know somebody who does, a friend, a relative, coworker, or you may actually just be working or studying, living together with somebody who you don't know actually has IBD. But it's important to understand um, people who have IBD they do need to take medications most of the time. Very rarely are there mild, mild cases where people do not require a medication to control the inflammation, which is the definition of inflammatory bowel disease. And this is our typical um, pyramid of treatment, which um, your physician would probably discuss with you in the clinic if you have IBD. And at the bottom, because that's one of the most commonly um, prescribed medications um, are the class called 5-aminosalicylates, and I'll try not to use brand names, but there are a few different uh, types of these drugs which all have the same active component, and that's typically more commonly used for ulcerative colitis. Um, however, if that class of medication is not enough to control that inflammation, and so the, your doctor would be uh, doing endoscopies, colonoscopies, or the gastroscopy from the top, and if despite being on the medication, you still have inflammation and the ulcerations, then many patients with IBD will require what's called immunosuppressants. And that means there are drugs that were designed to suppress all that inflammation that's occurring and suppress the, immu the overactive immune system. Um, and there are mainly two types out there, that one is a pill form, um, and the other one can be an injection or a pill uh, that I've shown there. And then as you go up the pyramid, for patients who those medications um, do not work for, or perhaps it works for them, but then they have flares every now and then, uh, they often will require steroids, uh, which commonly is the, you'll hear the name prednisone. Unfortunately, steroids have many side effects. Um, so oftentimes it can cause mood disturbances, uh, poor sleep or, or changes in sleep pattern. It can cause uh, weight gain, um, acne, um, and just uh, bone, uh, bone issues as well, osteoporosis uh, with long-term use. And so as physicians and your healthcare team, uh, we try to avoid the use of steroids and especially long-term steroids. So oftentimes we'll have to go up that pyramid um, to what are called biologics. And biologics are drugs that were um, designed to target specific proteins that are thought to cause the inflammation that results in uh, inflammatory bowel disease. 
Um, and right now, there are a few biologics out there. Uh, they're mainly injections, so you, you um, have a needle that you might uh, self-inject or you might have your pharmacist or a nurse inject for you. And there are a few biologics out there now uh, where you would go to an infusion clinic um, and you would have to go there every several weeks uh, to every like eight weeks um, to have your medications. In some cases, these standard um, medications that we use uh, to control inflammation may not be enough, or perhaps in some cases, um, a person's uh, cause for their IBD is not targeted uh, by those specific medications that are on the market. So you may be approached at some point, um, or you may know someone who's been approached to participate in clinical trials. And that's very important because um, the drug companies, together with uh, clinicians and scientists, are trying to find other uh, drugs, be it biologics or other forms of oral medications, to try to help as many people with inflammatory bowel disease as possible. And because we now know that there are many different causes or um, inflammatory uh, proteins that are causing that inflammation, they are developing uh, different targets, um, different um, mechanisms to try to control that disease. And so that's why now there are new drugs, new biologics just approved uh, for use in Canada in the last year or so, and there'll be new ones coming out this year as well. And la last but not least, and I say that um, is surgery, and I say it's not the least because in some cases, surgery may be the better option or may be the more appropriate option for a person with inflammatory bowel disease versus medications. And it depends on what type of IBD you have, uh, whether it's Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and it depends on the severity, um, the response to medications. In some cases now, actually, we are being more aggressive. We're trying to control inflammation as soon as possible, so as soon as diagnosis occurs, and before allowing uh, the damage uh, to occur. So this is why the pyramid has been reversed, and more physicians and healthcare teams are being more aggressive, and uh, it's called more of a top-down approach. So don't be alarmed if you or the person you know who has IBD has been uh, suggested uh, to go on immunosuppressants or biologics. That is because we're trying to control the inflammation before it causes uh, too much damage. So in terms of IBD and pregnancy, this is extremely important because active IBD, preconception, so before pregnancy, has been associated with uh, infertility or difficulty conceiving the pregnancy. And active disease before pregnancy is actually associated with risk of continued disease and continued worsening of disease activity during pregnancy. This is a little counterintuitive because people used to think that inflammation or immune diseases get better during pregnancy. However, that is not always the case um, in IBD. An active IBD during pregnancy at any stage, so first, second, and third trimester, is associated with risk for miscarriage, stillbirths, preterm births, uh, smaller babies, as well as low birth weight babies. So it's very important uh, for anyone um, who is uh, planning to start a family and have children to aim to be in remission for at least three to six months before attempting to become pregnant. And very important, um, as Catherine has said earlier, is that you, you engage your healthcare team, engage the nurses in your clinic, your family doctors, your gastroenterologists, and tell them where you are in your life and, and if you are planning. And also for men who, are, who have IBD, who are considering becoming fathers, they also need to know that they can and they should talk to their healthcare team because there are certain medications, for example, sulfasalazine, which can reduce um, fertility from the male point of view. So I've tried to show here that multidisciplinary circle of care. Um, it includes not only the spouse, um, the mother, the, the potential mother and the father, um, but it also includes uh, people like the gastroenterologist, um, maternal fetal medicine once they're pregnant, an obstetrician and gynecologist, and the family doctors, pharmacists, the nurses, uh, midwives, and also I didn't put on here, but dietitian is very important to make sure you have the right uh, nutrition. And specifically for the treatments, just to summarize really quickly is, we will continue most of these medications um, before and during and after pregnancy if it's required to keep the disease under control. However, there are certain medications uh, which I've crossed out there. So methotrexate, one of the immunosuppressants, that's the one that can be either oral medication or a injection. 
um, should not be taken because it is known to cause uh, birth defects and miscarriage. And if a person is considering a clinical trial, then it's very important that they also talk to their doctor that they potentially may wish to have a child because the, the clinical trials, some of them are experimental drugs that are in, uh, early in their development uh, where it's not known uh, potential effects on pregnancy and so um, you cannot become pregnant uh, while you're in the clinical trial or in a short time afterwards. Um, and this is just a diagram to walk you through from preconception, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. Uh, basically, again, just summarizes that methotrexate, absolute no-no at any of these time points. And then the other drugs would be continued if necessary to keep the disease under control. And I didn't have a slide here for delivery, but um, when I showed that initial diagram comparing ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, uh, women who have active perianal disease where they have the abscess or fistulas around the bum, usually would end up having a C-section uh, to avoid any damage uh, down there. And finally, for breastfeeding, yes, uh, mothers with IBD can breastfeed. Uh, we know that there are tiny amounts of the medications that cross the breast milk. Uh, so sometimes it would be recommended that they can pump and dump that breast milk after the first four hours after ingesting their medication. And that mainly applies to um, prednisone and uh, Imuran, or one of the immunosuppressants. But generally, uh, breast milk does have other good components, so nutrients, immune proteins. You heard earlier about the illegal saccharides and stuff in the diet. Um, this is found as well in breast milk, um, so it helps to um, feed the newborn's microbiome. Uh, but basically, the only drug uh, that we use for therapy, methotrexate, uh, must be stopped and avoided during breastfeeding. So take home points basically is that a person with IBD, a male or a female, who is planning a pregnancy or to father a pregnancy should aim to be in remission before um, and for the mother uh, during pregnancy. It's very important to speak with your family doctor, your gastroenterologist uh, before you're planning pregnancy and that is because in case you have to switch therapy or they have to adjust things. So do not hesitate to discuss your concerns and your management with your entire healthcare team. Um, remember, it's a multidisciplinary care team, so it's not just the doctor, it's everybody else that's involved. And also, just remember the fathers uh, to be with IBD also need to uh, pay attention to their medications that they're on. Um, that's it. Wonderful.